you, Ben. Georgina, thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Vice President. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted gaps in society that challenge our security and cohesiveness. But we now have an opportunity to address these societal and economic challenges. The transatlantic relationship found its feet during a period of global crisis. And now we can dream big together about what a post-pandemic world can and should be. One of the gaps exposed by the crises of the past year has been the state of democracy in the world. Worrying trends away from liberal democracy have cropped up in recent years. Many of us in the transatlantic community have noted this development with concern. We've seen short-term responses, but now is the time to push the envelope, to invest the time and energy needed to supercharge the democratic project. We have seen in our own transatlantic history and in the world around us that there are no guarantees. Democracy requires regular active tending. We've touched on this challenge in other sessions at the forum, especially concerns about the rapid rise of digital authoritarianism and the EU's democracy action plan with Vice President Jourova. An inclusive transatlantic agenda should prioritize more open democratic institutions that are accessible to their citizens. Our next two discussions will explore a couple different initiatives aiming to do exactly that. First, we'll dive deep into the Biden administration's planned summit for democracy. What started as a campaign proposal for then candidate Biden has gained momentum in recent months, but there is still much to be hammered out. How does one go about building a summit for democracy? The following dialogue will explore a brand new pan-European democratic initiative the Conference on the Future of Europe. How will this project increase democratic access for EU citizens? What lessons can the United States draw from this endeavor? We'll explore this in greater detail shortly, but first things first. We'll turn now to our own Ben Judah, senior fellow with the Europe Center, to introduce our next session on delivering the summit for democracy. Ben, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for handing that over to me and for joining us here today for what promises to be a riveting discussion on the Biden administration's plans for a summit for democracy. So first I'd like to introduce our highly distinguished uh, uh, panel, beginning with uh, Dr. Tori Tausig, Research Director at the Harvard Kennedy School's Project on Europe and a non-resident fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. We're also joined by Dr. Michael Carpenter, the Managing Director at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement and a non-resident senior fellow at our own Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. And last but not least, least, um, we're delighted to be joined by Reinhard, Reinhard Butikofer, MEP, the uh, distinguished member of the European Parliament and chair of the Delegation for Relations with the People's Republic uh, of China and a member of the Green Europe Free Alliance uh, bloc in the, uh, in the Parliament, that's the German Green Party. So I'd like to kind of begin with you, Tori, which is you know, what is the vision for a summit for democracy? Where did this idea come from? And what do they hope to achieve with it? Well, thank you, Ben. And it's great to be here uh, with you all today. We have certainly heard a lot about the summit for democracy. There's been a lot of commentating from outside of government on this summit. I think the driving reason for it is because there is broad recognition of the reality that democracy is in trouble around the world. I mean, and just look at the indices, Freedom House, Varieties of Democracy Project, all of them show that democracy is on the decline and authoritarianism is resurging around the world. And so there is a strong need for it globally. And there is also a strong need to have the United States at the table for these discussions, given our own uh, internal setbacks. So I think it's, it's a call based on reality and it's one, it's a focus that's very much needed at this point in time. And um, a kind of follow up, uh, follow up question, which is what do you, what do we know about the shape of this summit that's going to take place? Do we know when it's going to happen, what the agenda is going to be, or is it uh, still a sort of aspiration? So there have been indications that this summit will take place before the end of 2021. But if we look at campaign statements made by uh, the Biden team, by candidate Biden at the time, uh, he said that the summit should do three things. One, uh, fight corruption. Two, defend against authoritarianism with an emphasis on election security. And three, advance human rights, uh, both at home and abroad. So those are the 
three priorities that have been indicated, and that's the, the timing that we know of thus far. So I'd like to go over to Reinhardt uh, now to get the perspective from uh, from Berlin and from uh, Brussels. I understand you're in Berlin uh, currently, but normally in uh, Brussels. How does this uh, summit seem from uh, the EU perspective? Is there a need for such a summit? Uh, what would the EU like to see in this summit? And how does your own experience uh, dealing with China uh, over the last uh, few months, which has been rather dramatic, uh, inform your point of view? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, there is great expectation around Europe for the summit and um, our common concern over China and its increasingly aggressive policies has been a great motor behind the realization that there is indeed a need for such a, a, a new effort. Um, the um, democracies um, that have been singled out and attacked separately by China already uh, form a long list. You, you could uh, think of Canada, you could think of Australia, um, the Czech Republic, uh, Sweden, Norway, other countries. So certainly there is a need of finding ways where democracies have each other's back. And um, this um, certainly should be um, an international conversation uh, with a strong transatlantic plan. And it should also involve not just OECD countries and OECD democracies, but particularly put an emphasis also on uh, including democracies from the global South and making sure that this is seen as a truly widely shared, widely shared effort. Uh, we, of course, around Europe also see the need to uh, make an all of society effort to uh, strengthen our own democracies. That's why um, there has been this initiative for the uh, conference um, um, on the future of Europe. This is about to be started formally coming Sunday in Strasbourg. Um, it's been slow in materializing um, and there has been a lot of huggling um, uh, about uh, institutional issues, how much will co governments keep control of the agenda, to what degree will citizens be invited to co-shape and to co-represent uh, uh, the uh, um, results of the conversation. Um, and it's, um, it's an effort that, that doesn't, um, that can't afford to waste uh, uh, much more time because it should be finalized by the beginning, uh, uh, the first quarter of next year. So, so basically, we're in the in the same kind of straitjacket as regards timing as the, the the Biden team's initiative on the summit of democracy. So, so I hope that both projects will inform each other. So, what are the main roadblocks in Europe towards a successful summit? Are there any recalcitrant member states? And what do you think of the question of who should be invited? Should an EU member state like uh, Hungary be invited? What about Turkey? You know, what are your views from uh, Berlin and Brussels on the invite list? I'm not sure I can uh, speak as a representative of Europe on that. I just give you my opinion. Um, there are, of course, uh, huge question marks as to how democratic uh, um, Hungary still is. Um, but I think we should um, em emphasize uh, the need to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, if, we, if we say we only will invite the 100% the clean democracies or even the, uh, those that are holier than the Pope, uh, maybe the uh, list of invitees will uh, be very short. And we want to uh, share an effort, strenuous as it will be, to uh, enlarge the scope of um, democratic governance, to, to also help some countries to maybe regain uh, orientation or get back on the feet. So I would be inclusive without guaranteeing the participants that they will be exempted from criticism. 
Hey, Ben, can I come in really quickly on this attendance Please. question? I'd love, love you to come in. I just wanted to add, and then we need to get to Mike because his, his comments are important, but um, I just wanted to make a quick point on attendance. Personally, I think it would be more interesting to have a summit that features, or that at least includes uh, subnational actors, civil society leaders, human rights activists, journalists, local politicians, mayors, um, for a sharing of best practices, for a discussion about next steps for networking, for really understanding how these, these actors that are at the forefront, the grassroots level of democracy, can carry the mission forward in their own countries. And so I think instead of asking, should Viktor Orban be at this summit? I mean, yes, the leaders are important, but what's to say that we can't have Hungarian civil society leaders there? Why can't we have Russian civil society leaders there, local officials? I think we should use this this moment of opportunity to be creative and to use our convening powers to bring the real actors for democracy to the table rather than hearing from our leaders sitting around a table, you know, naming and shaming other countries, you know, to the one, one hand it's important, but, but let's bring the, the real actors of democracy together to, to learn best practices. So a summit for democracy and not a summit of democracies, uh, I, I sort of, t I take it. So Mike, I'd like to, come over and talk to you about the agenda. And I thought we'd kick off with a topic which I know is very dear to your heart, which is corruption. And do you think this is the right focus? What do you think could be achieved at the summit? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, I do think it's important. I also think it's important, however, to set expectations straight in terms of what a single meeting of heads of state and civil society and others can achieve. I mean, this is gonna be the beginning, hopefully, of a reinvigorated process of defending and strengthening democracy, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it's just one meeting in what will hopefully be a regular series of events to strengthen democracy. Corruption is at the heart of that. Here's how I see this happening though. And of course I'm on the outside. These are just my personal opinions, but I view this as an opportunity for states to self-select. Right. This is not this is not something for people in Washington to decide, you know, whether this country qualifies as a democracy or not. What we need is countries that are willing to come and to undertake certain um, commitments. They have to, for example, pledge to abide by the principle of judicial independence, to abide by the principle of media pluralism to fight corruption within their system by having transparency about government procurement and so on and so forth. So I see this as a series of steps that the countries will, uh, will hopefully take that come to the table and where they also agree to be judged by their peers. And this second part is crucial because uh, it's one thing to pledge in the abstract to do something and then go home and it's business as usual. It's quite another thing to say, okay, yes, I agree to transparency in terms of anti-money laundering regulations, but then I also want to be held accountable by my fellows, uh, by my fellow democracies, whether my government is actually fulfilling its pledge. So how do we turn this into a long-term process? I really like your point about how we shouldn't just focus on the summit, but view it as the beginning of something. Well, again, I think this is uh, an opportunity to get countries that are enthusiastic about undertaking such commitments uh, to sit at a table together and then to work through a variable set of different institutional sort of geometries, if you like, uh, to advance those goals. So again, the summit is not the be all and end all. It is hopefully a sort of a galvanizing point where countries take ownership of this issue and then they push it out into various different institutions, whether it's the, the US-EU partnership, whether it's the D10, whether it's the OECD, the OSCE and various other institutions that have little different pieces and chunks of the democracy promotion, anti-corruption, good governance agenda, and then see where there's most traction. But it has to be done globally. It can't be done in just one particular region of the world. Can I come in, Ben? Of course you can. I'd be delighted. Well, I, I would argue that parliaments could play a particular role in, in uh, making this a long-term effort. Um, you've seen over the last year uh, a huge increase of um, a bilateral cooperation between uh, parliamentarians from different parts of the world. You've had the IPAC, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, with um, uh, more than 200 
members of parliaments from 20 different um, parliaments. You have uh, increasing cooperation between US Congress and the European Parliament, for instance. And I would insist, and even that has even been included in, uh, in the new uh, framing of the uh, transatlantic dialogue on China that now also includes a parliamentary dimension. And parliamentarians are more outspoken often on issues of democracy and uh, they have an, another access to, to the, the wider public so I think they should be given a, a particular role in sustaining and driving these efforts in the long term. So I'd like to follow up that with a question of what's to avoid from your experience? What should, mistakes should can we steer clear of in making sure this is a successful summit and a successful long-term process? Well, I think uh, the biggest problem is talking about too much at the same time. I think without focus, uh, nothing will be achieved. So uh, uh, maybe we should focus on anti-corruption measures. Maybe we should focus on anti-fake news interference. Uh, and, uh, if, if we have a list of priorities that is not longer than five items, I think that's the max. And, and, and not trying to, to address and solve everything in one go. And, and then uh, uh, identify a subsequent um, agenda for for next such effort. Uh, that's the most important thing. And the, the second is give people an opportunity to excel, create mechanisms where where which which uh, give countries or participants uh, subnational um, institutions that might be interested in participating, civil society institutions that might have a, uh, an interest, give them an, an opportunity to gain from being active. If it's a duty, um, it may be forgotten. If it's something that allows you to shine, that is um, what gets people active. Tori, I'd like to bring the conversation back to you and ask, you know, what steps should the administration be taking right away to make sure this is a success? Well, I think just to footstop a few uh, lines that have been said by both Mike and, and Reinhardt, I think it's important early on for the administration to avoid making the summit into a grand symbolic gesture and the beginning of a an institutionalized alliance of democracies. I think not only is that over-promising, but it also is just doesn't jive with reality that we have institutions in place that have the machinery, the mechanisms that focus on these democracy issues, um, some of which Mike mentioned. And also that, again, we don't need another symbolic gathering of, of grand promises. We need a summit that focuses on very concrete steps that attendees can pledge to uphold, but also carry through on it. And this is where I think the focus on corruption particularly in the transatlantic sense, we actually can make a lot of progress on. There is a lot of, of, of interest in tackling this issue on both sides of the Atlantic, whether it's on counting mon countering money laundering or uh, closing tax loopholes. This is where we can make progress. And so I think this is an important focus for the administration to have now and going into the summit. Just to kind of uh, follow up question on that is we've talked about like the role that the EU can play in cooperating with the US. What about and also the global south, but especially with corruption, do you see a role for the UK uh, in this? Absolutely. I, I think, and Ben, you could probably point to a number of policies that the UK is already looking at on the on the corruption kind of tax evasion front. You're the, the real expert here. Uh, but when it comes to corruption, I do think it's important to break down some of the geographic silos uh, that, that Reinhardt also mentioned. You know, this can't just be a conversation between Northern democracies. This can't be just a transatlantic conversation. We need to have the global South at the table. We need to have like-minded partners from the Indo-Pacific Pacific at the table in order to ensure that we're not, you know, again, just a small club of democracies talking to one another. This needs to be a truly uh, global and globally represented summit on, on the issue of cor corruption, but also just on representation more broadly. So, Mike, I'd like to sort of come back to, to you. How do you view the summit as sitting in the administration's grand strategy? 
Well, the administration has, from the very start, prioritized democratic values, human rights, and this pushback against uh, the resurgence of authoritarianism. And so this is obviously a central part to that. Um, you know, I, you can also overstate uh, how significant this summit will be as compared to various other policy initiatives that the administration is pursuing. I think it's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I, I agree with Reinhardt that it needs to be uh, very strenuously prioritized on just a few items. I personally think this is, look, this is not the beginning of some technical negotiation of, you know, anti-money laundering regulations. It is aligning countries on the overarching principles of democratic values. And to my mind, you know, you can, you can pick and choose your favorite ones. You know, I, I mentioned at the outset, I think media pluralism, judicial independence, uh, some transparency with regard uh, to uh, financial flows. Those are sort of crucial to the functioning of democracy in the 21st century. And we need countries to sort of recommit to those principles and then push forward the actual difficult work of spelling out nitty gritty in terms of regulation, in terms of perhaps international treaties and conventions, what that looks like going forward, what sort of uh, institutional uh, body the, those uh, those commitments uh, then take. So I'd like to step out of the discussion of the summit per se, and I'd like to ask you about some of your views on the situation regarding democracy on the ground in your area of expertise in Eastern Europe. You know, is there a crisis of democracy and American democracy promotion in Ukraine and in the sort of so-called near abroad between the EU and Russia? And do you think the summit could make a difference there? Well, I, you know, I don't know if I would say there's a, a crisis of democracy. What there is, is this uh, decades long struggle between authoritarian oligarchy and liberal democracy. Uh, you see it very clearly in Belarus. You see it in Ukraine. You see it in Georgia. You see it in Armenia. There, you know, the, all of these countries have been punctuated by various sort of popular movements against uh, oligarchy and against authoritarianism. Uh, all of them have had some form of clampdown uh, from repressive regimes. Uh, and it's this, you know, it's this tug of war back and forth uh, in this entire region to the east of the EU. And in some cases, actually, even within some of the EU member states and in the Western Balkans, too. So it, it's incumbent, I think, on the US and its European partners to lend support to those democratic movements, uh, at a minimum moral support, but then also uh, sort of more tools as well for them to, to fight back against this both authoritarian trend and oligarchic trend, which are inextricably linked. So on the case study of Ukraine, how could Ukrainian attendance at the summit, Ukraine entering sort of certain obligations at the summit, Ukrainian civil society coming to the summit, how could that change things for the better? Well, look, Ukraine has been making tremendous progress since 2014, but it's also had some, some moments of backsliding. So you've seen, for example, the independent supervisory board of Naftahaz, the state-owned gas company, suspended so that a new CEO could be put in place. You've seen attempts to emasculate the anti-corruption institutions, which are politically independent, but where certain actors would like to have them under the guise of the cabinet of ministers or under other political authorities. And so it's, you know, it's important that if Ukraine is going to be a part of this conversation, that Western countries say very clearly that we expect from Ukraine certain steps that include corporate governance standards with regards to its state-owned enterprises that include uh, allowing for anti-corruption institutions to be truly independent. There needs to be judicial reform in Ukraine as well. So it's, you know, it's standing by those principles and then pushing the government constantly to make good on them. Right now, I'd like to bring the conversation uh, back to you. And you know, one of the big kind of themes of our conference has been, you know, what uh, anticipating the change uh, that is likely to come in Germany. How do you and your party, the German Greens, uh, feel that uh, democracy and the relationship with China and Russia will look different if you, um, you know, win the elections that are coming up? Well, I, I guess it's um, a pretty safe uh, expectation that we will um, take a tougher approach towards authoritarian regimes. That, that's been visible uh, in our policies uh, uh, over the last years. And uh, 
we intend to help um, making uh, Germany and, and, and other countries uh, uh, more proactive players uh, in, in, in that regard. Uh, but um, certainly uh, it would not be helpful if we, um, um, if we chose um, an attitude of arrogance vis-a-vis -vis others. Um, President Biden has said recently, uh, and I, I thought he, uh, he, he really hit the nail, uh, that uh, there is a certain, I'm not sure he used the word crisis, but there's a certain um, uh, big challenge for democracies. Are we able to deliver dealing with the real challenges that, that are in front of us, like refugee issues, uh, climate change issues, international um, um, uh, justice issues. And if we can't, uh, then um, all our well-meaning um, uh, democratic propaganda will um, be a car without wheels. And uh, I, I think we should uh, approach this as a kind of collective team democracy effort and not putting individual countries on the spot. Not, not talking down to them, also listening to voices from minor players and not make this an anti-somebody um, uh, event, but rather uh, shape it as an effort to refurbish and to rebuild the shining city on the hill. Um, we have seen uh, democratic weaknesses all around Europe, including in our own country. Look at AFD, the far right nationalist xenophobic racist party. Uh, it still has uh, support from about 10% of ger German voters. You have populism, nationalism, nativism, anti-globalism in so many countries. We cannot uh, be um, uh, arrogant and say, we got it solved. We're now teaching others. We all have to be students. So Tori, I'd like to bring the conversation back to you and ask, a kind of more general question, which is how does democracy fit into the administration's geopolitics towards Europe and internationally, like more broadly? And is there a tension between democracy and some of the administration's other goals uh, on the global scene? It's a great question, Ben. If I could, without um, coming across as overly political, one element that I really admire of this administration's approach toward democracy abroad is that, I mean, take, take the last administration's national security uh, directive, for example. Th this is where the paradigm changed to great power competition, the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism, competing with Russia and China on the world stage. However, one thing that I found that was truly lacking was an emphasis on looking at our own foundations of, of democratic resiliency, our own um, internal resiliency and renewal that's needed to compete with Russia and China. To me, that always rang hollow. I thought the focus on state-based competition was important. The, the struggle against authoritarianism was the right one, but there was no internal focus on how our own uh, democracies need to be strengthened in, in this competition. So I think that's a critical component and a good component of the way that this administration has taken um, our broader foreign policy uh, direction moving forward. The second element uh, that I think is going to be a really fine line to walk is on uh, garnering our allies, uh, rallying our allies around an agenda of democratic renewal without making this an anti-China agenda. I think the administration has actually done a good job of this thus far, particularly in Europe. I don't think you get allies to the table when we talk about you know, countering China, creating an anti-China agenda. It just doesn't work, I think, given the divisions that we see across Europe. Although I think Reinhardt is probably one of the, the stronger uh, pushing back on China voices in Europe. But I think this is where, again, we need to make this about ourselves, our own democracy, and in strengthening the pillars of um, our democratic institutions at home for competing against authoritarian states on the world stage. So Reinhardt, just to kind of ask you the same question, is there a plan in Germany, in the EU, to really rebuild the foundations of European uh, democracy and society to make it more resilient for the 21st century? No, there isn't. Uh, there is a plan now to, to um... Uh, have uh, to, to run uh, an electoral campaign uh, that might have momentous consequences for Germany and for Europe. And then we will have a similarly important campaign right thereafter 
in France when President Macron will try to uh, get re-elected against strong opposition from the far right, from uh, Marine Le Pen. Um, so these two elections will, uh, will uh, decide whether the two most important pillars uh, of the uh, political governance system uh, around uh, the EU will um, be still uh, strong. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, we try to reach out to the citizens, we reach out to uh, stakeholders to um, get them involved in the, in, in, in the context of the conference on the future of Europe to uh, learn from um, in societal input. Um, I think Europe has never been just the execution of a plan. Europe has been uh, a, success, a succession of steps uh, when we uh, uh, managed to agree, sometimes haphazardly, on uh, uh, compromises and intermediate solutions that would allow us to take one step forward and then um, leave uh, some of our problems to be solved in the future. Europe is um, progress um, that we devise as we go. Europe is uh, uh, history in the making. It's, it's not a plan because 27 sovereign nations can hardly agree on an uh, ex ante plan. They have to agree on what they can um, um, do now to solve their problems, the most urgent problems that we have. And we, we have seen that even big steps are possible. Um, two years ago, nobody would have expected that we would get the uh, uh, recovery uh, plan that we now have. Everybody would have uh, expected the Germans to block it. Uh, Merkel took a big step forward and jumped over her own shadow and uh, facilitated that. That's the innovative character of Europe. We we'll always find new resources. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a brilliant panel. I couldn't afford a more distinguished uh, panel of people to talk about this issue. And now I'd like to pass over to our own Ambassador Gardner.